So atom, light interactions. So we will focus just on the electric field, E field. Magnetic field effects are suppressed by the velocity of the um, electrons divided by C. And that, you know, is the fine structure constant. So magnetic field effects are suppressed. Um, ignore magnetic V over C corrections with V over C again of the order of the fine structure constant. We will also think of optical, typically optical frequencies, lambda in the optical range. So from about 4,000 to 8,000 angstroms. And that's much, much bigger than A0, which is about 0 0.5 angstroms. And that's good for our approximation that um, the wave is relatively constant, being the wavelength so large, it's constant over the extent of the atom. So we will think of the electric field at the atom, E at the atom. Our electric field, a, lot, a bit of notation, will depend on time. And it will be a real function of time times a unit vector to begin with. This will get more interesting because we're going to be dealing with uh, thermal radiation. So eventually, this vector n will be pointing and we will average it over all directions because thermal radiation comes with all polarizations and in all directions. So there will be a little bit of averaging necessary for that. That will happen next time as we wrap up uh, this discussion. So this um, picture is of an atom sitting here. And in particular, it's electron, um, which is the particle that reacts the most to the electric field. And there's a unit vector n. And there's e of t here. So the electric field e of t is 2 e naught in our conventions, cosine omega t times the vector n. So what is the vector, no, the scalar potential, rt, is minus r times e of t. This is the formula that gives you e as minus the gradient of phi. This formula is not true in the presence of magnetic fields in general. There's a time derivative of the vector potential. But again, we're ignoring magnetic effects. So this is good enough for us. If you take the gradient of this formula, the only r dependence is here. There's no r dependence in this electric field. And um, in particular, we consider the wavelengths to be very big. And uh, this is good enough. So what is the perturbing Hamiltonian due to the coupling of the electric field to the charged particle? And we'll say atom, and we'll put an electron or something, and we'll say the charge is Q. Eventually, it will be minus E for the electron, but let's keep it at Q. Delta H is Q times phi 
of R and T. So this is minus Q times R times E of T. vector or minus q times r times n times e of t. So, so far simple things. We're just considering the electric field and how it acts on a charged particle. This is, of course, the simplest situation. We will be considering in this course soon, in fact, starting next lecture, the general interaction of charged particles with electromagnetic fields. But for the time being, and in this approximation, this is enough. And uh, we will define now a dipole operator. It's something that you should keep in mind. It's uh, the usual thing when you define dipoles is you sum or integrate over charges times position vectors. So this is a dipole operator. Operator. And emphasize the operator because of the R. Uh, when you have matrix elements, transitions between states, everything, we will have to deal with those matrix elements of R and that's why we'll have a dipole term there. So delta H at this moment has become what? Minus the dipole times the electric field. So, um, so let's do this. Minus the dipole. I'll do it here minus the dipole dotted with the electric field. Vector. Or minus d dot n with 2 in, times the magnitude of the electric field or minus d dot n times 2 e naught cosine of omega t. You know, factors of 2 keep us busy, <laughs> always. And we have to get them right. Remember when we uh, did our definition of perturbed Hamiltonians, we said that delta h was going to be equal to 2 h prime cosine of omega t and our transition amplitudes and everything were written in terms of h prime. So this was our definition. So at this moment we can isolate h prime here. So h prime is everything except for the 2 and the cosine of omega t. So h prime for our problem of atoms interacting with uh, electromagnetic fields is a dipole interaction and it's given by this nice simple formula. That's our kind of important end result. So if we have this Hamiltonian, we have calculated the transition rates for or Actually, more not the transition rates, the probability for transitions, for example, from B to A as a function of time. When we have a harmonic perturbation coupled to a two-level system, we have a probability. We don't have yet a rate. We just have a probability. And this is equal to the other one, to the reverse one, and it's for h a b prime squared over h squared sine squared of omega b a minus omega over 2 t over omega b a minus omega squared. 
That was the formula we had. In our case now, h prime ab is that, so we'll get the following. 4 e0 squared. The e0 factor here goes out. And then we will have the matrix elements of the dipole operator, d dot n, a, B. So it will all be matter of the dipole operator, H squared, and the same factor, sine squared, omega B, A minus omega over 2T over omega B, A minus omega squared. So this is the transition probability. We don't have a rate, but the rate will come when we integrate over all the photons that contribute to this process. And we'll get an exact analog of a Fermi-Golden rule. So that will be next time.